Hello and welcome to Monster Rama. I hope you're having a good time attending these panels. I'm Jeff Thompson, and today I am uh, talking with you uh, about Dark Shadows, Dan Curtis, and horror. And my uh, uh, guests on the panel are Mark Dewidziak, who uh, is the author of The Night Stalker Companion, and he wrote the uh, introduction to produced and directed by Dan Curtis. And Armand Mastroianni, who uh, is the director of He Knows You're Alone and Cameron's Closet, and he directed two episodes of the 1991 Dark Shadows. Uh, and this one in particular is, is perhaps the best episode of the series. It's, it's my favorite, and I think it's extremely well done. It contains the costume party and the seance. And I'm Jeff Thompson. I have written three books about producer-director Dan Curtis, including the television horrors of Dan Curtis, as well as a couple of others. So Armand, how did you meet uh, Dan Curtis? Oh, that's an interesting story. Um, I had um, been working in Toronto on a, on a series called Friday the 13th uh, for Paramount. And I had finished, I, I did about six or seven of them. And then I came back, I was living on Staten Island at the time. And I remember being outside in the back and my wife comes and says, you have a telephone call. It's uh, Dan Curtis calling you from Los Angeles. I said, Dan Curtis is calling here? So I took the phone and um, I heard, hello, this is Dan Curtis. I said, oh my gosh, hi, how are you? You call, what a surprise to hear from you. I, I had never met him. And he says, you know, I just finished watching one of your shows uh, uh, on Friday the 13th. And I have to say, my God, you shoot exactly the way I do. I said, really? Well, that's, I'm flattered. And maybe I'm copying from you, who knows? <laughs> so we started talking and, and, and um, he asked me if I was a, knew of Dark Shadows. And I said, of course I do. You know, I, you know the, the, the old show that used to be on. He says, well, we're doing a, a new version of it. And um, I'd like you to come on board and direct a couple of shows. So I said, Wow, that's fantastic. I'm flattered. Absolutely. Love to do it. Sure enough, I went out to uh, do a couple of shows. I followed Dan. How much of this do you want me to go through? Do you want, do you want to know the whole story? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. I'd love to hear it. Well, I, I got out there and he, he was finishing up the pilot. He had finished the pilot. He was doing the sh show one and two, the, the first two hours. I was going to follow him. Well, when I got out there, I met him. He was actually laying on the grass, having a nap because they were setting up shots and stuff like that. And um, I finally was introduced to him and he says, oh, what a pleasure to meet you. And I said, thank you, same here. And very quickly, <laughs> people started to surround me and said, be very careful. He's a monster, he'll yell, he screams, he does this, he does that. And I said, okay, thank you, you know. <laughs> never, 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 ever with me. He was the nicest man I had ever met. He was, you know, I'm just going to throw one little thing in here. When I was in, in, um, in school, I had made some shorts and my film, one of my shorts won an award and the, the, the judge of that festival was Otto Preminger. Oh. Now, he was considered to be a monster. Again, I go to meet Otto Preminger. He calls, he wants to meet me. I go to meet him, the most polite, the nicest man in the world, invites me to his home, invites all his friends to come and watch my film, has a big buffet, takes me to meet all the people in, in New York City. So the legends that precede these people are not always accurate because I, I, I was treated with such respect and kindness from Dan Curtis. And I believe that comes out of the fact that he felt we were kindred folk, you know what I mean? We were both directors, we both shared the vision and he loved that I shared his vision. And that ultimately let me, he, you know, when I had finished shooting my second show, he said, I don't want you to leave, I want you to stay on. And I said, well, he said, I'm so sorry I'd hired other directors to fill up those slots, I can't do it now, but I would have you do all the rest of them. And I said, I'm, thank you, Dan. And he said, so what I wanna do is I wanna keep you on as the producer and you'll produce the shows 
and just make sure that the other directors follow the look we've, we, we are establishing. It was very important to him that, that the, film, the, the show maintained a certain visual style and look. And I'm, I'm very, very grateful to him for that. And he was, he was, just, a, he was just so friendly. And he, I'd always go to dinner at his house on Sundays and we share with his family, his daughter, his wife. And it was just uh, the nicest guy in the world. I, you know, I knew people were terrified of him. And, and I mean, I have stories that are, you know, hilarious between him and the head of MGM at the time, David Gerber, who was very much, you know, in charge of uh, making sure the budgets were always adhered to and all that. And Dan's insistence on style and look and all that stuff was extravagant. You know, he wanted things to go longer if it had to. You know, he wouldn't mind if we went into overtime or we spent more money on extras or we got more costumes. And, and of course, David was just the complete opposite because he's looking to save money. So they <laughs> they'd get in when David or and Dan were together. Dan wore a hearing aid, and so did David. So when David would come to the set, these two old guys would get together and start screaming at each other, and they'd get in each other's face, and as soon as they get within a certain range, they'd both go, like this, they'd pull back because their ear, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, ear, ear aids would, would, would uh, bounce off each other. So it was hilarious, and I used to have a great time with, David Gerber also, and he was considered also terrible to work with, but they were ter terrific with me. So my experience with this whole, um, uh, you know, project was, was just wonderful. And oh, I can't speak highly enough to Dan, Dan Curtis. That's good to hear. Mark, mm -hmm. how did you meet Dan Curtis? Well, um, it was about the same time that, that Armand did, because uh, I, it was actually the, um, the, the reboot, the NBC primetime version that uh, kind of introduced me to Dan. Um, uh, I was doing a package of stories for Cine Fantastic magazine on the old and the new Dark Shadows. And I'd gotten to know some of the people on the old show. Um, so this was a fun assignment for me. And uh, at the very same time, almost the exact same time, uh, a publisher had asked me about writing a history of the Night Stalker series. And of course, you know, Dan produced the first movie and then produced and directed the second one. So I had a lot of reasons to talk to Dan all of a sudden. And the next time I was in Los Angeles, um, there's a fellow, Dan's assistant, Armand will probably remember, Jim Pearson. Yes, uh, very well. Yeah, and Jim um, had me come by the Goldwyn uh, Studios where the set was. And uh, so I was kind of there all during the time that they were putting it together, starting to put it together. and. And I got to know Dan, and um, I'd heard the horror stories too, uh, you know, <laughs> from from various people. And uh, Dan and I hit it off right from the start. And uh, I later found out that I was one of the few journalists that he enjoyed talking to, that he liked talking to. That he, whenever he had a project come up, he'd get he'd jump on the phone, or if I was in Los Angeles, I'd go by the office. And once the Night Stalker book was published, and he liked how it came out. He doesn't always come off well in that book, by the way. There are some, you know, uh, moments in that book where somebody might take issue, but Dan said, no, it's, it's honest, it's true. And those things happened and you, you told the story correctly. So whenever I would visit him in whatever office he was in, because his office has changed a couple of times. Whenever, you know, I was gonna go into his office and it, they had said, you know, that I was on my way in, I would hear Dan's voice bellowing from inside Mr. Night Stalker! And then, you know, I would walk in and I would sit and get an audience. And Dan was one of the best storytellers, not just, you know, visually as a director and a producer, just sitting like this, sitting behind his desk talking. Dan was a great storyteller. Profane as all get out. Dan could not put together two sentences without five profanities sprinkled into them and in places where you wouldn't even put profanity, by the way. He was a master at it, you know. Man, uh, you're up right there. That's when these two guys, the head of MGM and Dan got together. That's all it was. Continuous. Oh, glue. 
No, the air had to Two be of them. They, <laughs> David Gerber was from Brooklyn, so he had that strong Brooklyn street voice. And he'd go, you mother effer, this and that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And Dan, you know, I mean, he did all this great television and all this stuff. And, you know, he does, you know, War and Remembrance and Winds of War and all those fantastic things he, do, he does in there with the Holocaust and, he, you know, Dark Shadows and all of this. And, you know, and I always say to people, Dan looked and talked like a longshoreman. If you, yeah. you know, he's the last person you would have thought would have done this sort of thing. But Dan, just sitting behind the desk talking was wonderful. And he could be extraordinarily sweet and he could be very funny. And, but he loved telling stories one-on-one. -on -one. And one of the few times he ever got quiet on me, I don't know that I've ever shared this story, but one of the few times he ever got quiet he knew that I had gone to the Dark, Dark Shadows festivals as a guest on a couple of occasions. Um, and he got quiet and he looked up at me and he said, what are they like? So what, what, what? He said, the festivals, what are they like? And I said, Dan, you should go. Don't, don't take my word for it. Don't ask me what they're like, go. And he said, no, it's not my kind of thing. I said, what do you mean it's not your kind of thing? Do you have a better thing, time to do with your weekend than to go someplace and have thousands of people tell you they love you and love what you did? And if you could sit in front of an audience of Dark Shadows fans, just like we're, this is a crime. I'm getting the, the front row seat here. I'm getting the benefit of all these great stories. All the Dark Shadows fans should hear these stories. And he never did. He never went. And I thought, always thought that that was such a shame and such a, a waste because it, it again, you know, I, I would have paid money to sit in the front row and hear Dan tell these stories, you know? Yes, other fans and I were disappointed that Dan Curtis never attended the Dark Shadows festivals. Mm -hmm. um, he would have been a marvelous guest. He was and is Dark Shadows. Mm -hmm. um, I never got to meet Dan Curtis. Um, I am good friends with Jim Pearson and uh, uh, have become friends with some of the stars of Dark Shadows over the years. I started watching Dark Shadows in September of 1967. I was not there uh, for the beginning. Uh, uh, I was homesick from school one day and I was turning the channels. And uh, the very first scene I saw, coincidentally, is the first scene on the old MPI home video tape the best of Dark Shadows. And it's David and Sarah in the basement of the old house. David is having a dream. And uh, in his dream, David and Sarah uh, see the coffin and they see the coffin open and they see Barnabas come out. So naturally, uh, from that moment on, I was hooked on the show mm -hmm. and um, uh, wrote for the Dark Shadows fanzines throughout the 70s and 80s and emceed many of the Dark Shadows festivals in the 80s. And some a little bit later, and um, um, began watching all of Dan Curtis's productions, uh, The Night Stalker, The Night Strangler, The Norless Tape, Scream of the Wolf, Curse of the Black Widow. Trilogy his two, of Terror. Yes, his two World War II miniseries. Yeah. And uh, uh, when Dan Curtis died in 2006, um, a website called Scoop asked me to write an obituary for him, for the, the website. It's a weekly e-newsletter called Scoop. And so I was happy to do it. I, I wrote the obituary, most of it off the top of my head. And I realized, well, at this moment, I'm trying to uh, decide what I want to write about for my doctoral dissertation. And I was thinking about film noir, but you know, there are countless books about film noir. So I thought, well, Dan Curtis needs to be uh, written about in a, in a dissertation, his, his horror films especially. And so that's uh, what gave me the idea to uh, uh, write my doctoral dissertation, which I later turned into my book, The Television Horrors of Dan Curtis. And Jim Pearson and Dan Curtis Productions were very helpful in uh, uh, sharing photographs uh, with me. Uh, photographs from all of uh, the uh, all four dozen of Dan Curtis's productions. So many pictures, in fact, so many rare pictures that that's what gave me the idea to go ahead and write two more books just so I can use all of the great pictures. So uh, uh, that's how I came to write those books. And uh, 
all three of them are now out in new uh, revised second edition. So I, I'm very pleased about that. Mark, when did you start watching Dark Shadows? Well, um, I became a horror fan at seven years old. Um, there was, I grew up in New York and a station WPIX Channel 11 mm -hmm. showed a movie called Abbott and Costello Meet yes. Frankenstein. And um, I was there for the Abbott and Costello half. I, I had never seen at that point something which was called a horror film, but I had seen quite a bit of comedy teams because that's what they gave us uh, as children's entertainment growing up in New York at the time. They gave us Laurel and Hardy and the Three Stooges and Abbott and Costello. So I was there for, for Bud and Lou, but you know, in the, that wonderful movie, there's Lugosi playing Dracula for only the second and last time on film. And it's an amazing performance. And by the time that movie was over, I was, uh, I was transformed into a horror fan. So mm -hmm. I was then uh, getting famous Monsters of Filmland magazine. I was, uh, I was pouncing on anything that came along. I was scouring the listings. Is there an old horror film on this week? Uh, anything. I was, uh, you know, uh, I, we didn't have the term monster kid back then. That's a modern term. Um, but that's what I was. I had become, you know, I, all of the uh, Aurora monster models are right up here. All 13 of them from my youth uh, are right there. So I was um, not a soap opera fan. Soap operas to me were what my, my Italian grandmother watched. She would set up her ironing in the afternoon. She always watched uh, As the World Turns on CBS. And she never referred to it as As the World Turns. I didn't know that was the title because she said, I'm going to watch my story. That's how she referred to it. It was time for me to watch my story. And as far as I was concerned, it was her story and she could have it. It was the most boring thing <laughs> I had ever seen. I didn't understand why anybody would watch a soap opera. <laughs> but then uh, in 1967, because if you were all tapped into the fandom, you start hearing, there's a vampire running loose in daytime television. I'm like, what? What? You know, so I checked it out. Barnabas was already out of the coffin at this point. Um, so I checked into it, and, and all of a sudden, yes, there was a vampire running loose in daytime television. And all of a sudden, I was watching a soap opera. Me, who said, you know, soap operas are not for me. Uh, all of a sudden, so I was 10 years old um, when I started watching Dark Shadows in 19... Uh, 67. And, um, and I was, I was hooked. I was, I was good and hooked. And one thing you have to remember is, unlike today, you know, I explained this, to, I, I teach a course on vampires and film on television at Kent State that I've created. Um, and I always have to explain to my kids, unlike today, there wasn't that much horror in the 1960s. You, you know, there's horror for every taste, every group, every demographic, you name it. There are vampires for that. You can, zombies for every taste there is. You could be a horror fan and never be watching the same thing now. But back then we all shared the same stuff and we all shared the same language and the same common language. Because we were, if you were a horror fan, you had to watch the old universal horror films. You had to watch the 1950s. Uh, science fiction horror films. You had to have that kind of conversation. So when something came along, you, you jumped on it. It's like when Night Gallery came along on, on NBC. Mm -hmm. We were all watching Night Gallery because, you know, and it was like, there's a horror series on. My, my, how could you not be watching it? So we all watched the, uh, the Outer Limits. We all watched The Twilight Zone. And we all had this common language. And when Dark Shadows came along, it was, it was quite the thing all of a sudden. And... Um, and, and, and then it wasn't until years later that I understood that it was revolutionary. It was a very, um, it was a very sneaky show. And, uh, but we'll get into that, I'm sure, in a little bit. Right. Armand, did you watch Dark Shadows 50 years ago or did you watch it later? You know, I'm going to confess that I didn't watch it because it was exactly what Mark was saying. It was a soap opera and it was one thing that I didn't watch. I, I, I did, however, I was an avid horror fan. I used to watch Channel 11 and all the, all the great, you know, the Invasion of the Body Snatchers and all those great films, The, the Thing and um, Alfred Hitchcock and all that stuff. Uh, so I loved the genre and I grew up in the genre. I ended up making the first movie I made was that kind of movie. Um, but I was aware of Dark Shadows. I just thought it was more of a I don't know, like uh, like Mark says, like the, the ladies would watch it at home in the afternoon. And I didn't feel a, akin to that. I, I wanted something a little more 
uh, I don't know, realistic for me. I, I, soap operas always came off phony to me because they, they felt live and they felt, you know. So I actually, no, but I did familiarize myself with it. I did revisit it, of course, when Dan called me and I was, I was totally aware of it. I knew of Barnabas. I had seen uh, uh, clips and stuff of the old shows, but uh, I was more involved with Dan's other horror films, you know, the Trilogy of Terror, the Night Stalker, all those things and loved, you know, Winds of War, War and Remembrance. I mean, those were just, see, I was lucky because I did not end up being a horror film director only. Because I worked also with Wes Craven. We did a series together. And he said, you know, we had dinner. We were having dinner one night. It was he and I that did this whole show called Nightmare Cafe. And he says, you know, I really, I'm, I'm envious of you. And I said, why? You're envious of me? And he said, uh, yeah, because you know, you get to make all different kinds of movies. You get to make horror films, you get to make dramatic films, love stories, action films, you know, all different stuff. And I'm, you know, in that thing, I go make a movie with Meryl Streep called Music of the Heart, no one goes to see it. So I said, well, I'll tell you what, we'll switch places. <laughs> you know, and he said, no, well, he, you know, he has, when you, when you establish yourself in that genre and, and it's like Alfred Hitchcock could never do a musical. Nobody would buy it. Nobody would be interested in seeing it. You know, you get sort of categorized. So thank God I was very blessed to be able to do all a, a very kind of diverse body of work, which I enjoy. I enjoy jumping from one thing to another, doing a historical drama or, uh, you know, uh, you know, an action film or a science fiction film, uh, all different kinds of, uh, you know, all different kinds of stuff. And, and so I, it's not that I didn't have the affinity for it, uh, for like, especially when I started Dark Shadows, it was one of my most pleasurable experiences for me. That whole, uh, you know, directing and producing of the show, we became such close, a close group, you know, Ben Cross, who just, we just lost recently. Uh, and and the whole cast was wonderful. Even little Joseph Gordon-Levitt was in that. He he was little Joey in the, in the, in the show. Uh, not um, not Joey. David, was, David, David. David. Yeah, um, we used to call him little Joey. Um, and um, just to tell you how close we were, when we were filming on a Friday afternoon and we had the weekend off, and Ben would say Ben Cross would be done with his makeup and everything, and uh, he would go down he would go down to Rosarita Beach ahead of us and get, get margaritas and everything ready. And then a whole group of us from the cast would drive down and enjoy the weekend there at the hotel. And, and that's, I mean, you don't usually do that with film crews or, and, and actors. You usually, uh, you've seen enough of them during the week. You know, you don't want to be away from them. We enjoyed each other. We enjoyed being each other, in each other's company. We loved it. And um, that, that, that comes from, I think, you know, everybody kind of connecting. Um, I, I, I took some big chances when I started Dark Shadows. I, I kind of broke some rules and I almost got fired on the very first day of filming. We were doing a, a scene where, um, oh God, I can't remember her name now. <sighs> anyway, she, she wakes up blonde. Uh, um, she was the, oh, why am I not thinking of her she name? The witch, Angelique. No, no, dead. not Angelique. Not Angelique. It was the, it was the other one who, who Barnabas fights Blackburn? on. Blackburn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Barbara. There was Barbara, Barbara Blackburn. Barbara Steele and Barbara Blackburn. Anyway, so I said, you know, it's it was a quarter of a page in the script that says she, she, you know, she wakes up, she senses Barnabas, she goes to the to the balcony, and he's there, and he bites her on the neck. Boom! It was a quick shot. It was supposed to be, you know, it was supposed to be a scene. I said, I want to make this into a big moment in the film. And so I started shooting. I started envisioning her walking with the leaves blowing across her feet. And she's wearing this very diaphanous gown with, you could basically see through it. And I said, I wanted the, the whole experience of, of going up to Barnabas and offering herself to him to be a very sexual and very erotic experience. Now, it was never shot like that. It was never done like that before in the scene. So I said to her, I said, Barbara, what I want you to do is I want you to go up to him. I want you to open up his shirt. I want you to run your fingers down his chest. And then I want you to turn your back to him 
and bring him down like this to your neck. I just had this vision in my head of doing it that way. Well, it was so sensational that I remember getting calls from MGM, the people that were watching and saying they were aroused watching it because they said it actually turned on, turned them on because her, uh, the camera goes down, her breasts are heaving and heaving. And when he bites her, droplets of blood ultimately come down, almost like an orgasm. That was my vision of the piece. Well, I remember hearing from MGM while we were filming that day, what the hell is taking so long? Why are we behind schedule? You guys are still shooting that little quarter of a page? And they would put me on the phone. I'd say, yeah, I just need some more shots and blah, 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 blah. Well, interestingly enough, Barbara Steele became one of my biggest fans and she defended me. She got on the phone. She said, don't you dare, don't you dare stop this. Yeah. <laughs> And I did something with her. You see that hair that she, she had it like that through the whole thing. I had a scene where Barnabas comes up to her where he's going to kill her. And he just, I said, I want you to run your fingers through her hair and just pull it apart. Let it all hang over her face and everything. And she just loved that. She goes, oh, my darling, this is wonderful. You know, she, she's such a wonderful person. We got, a, 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 we had so much fun. So they defended me. We shot this scene. It made the front page of that shot of the girl uh, having uh, Barnabas uh, bite her on the neck, uh, Barbara, it made the front page of USA Today and said, erotic dark shadows is, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it really, people started calling in and saying, this is great stuff. This is great stuff. And Lynn Loring, who was David, um, uh, David Gerber's uh, assistant, uh, she was not assistant. They were working, they were doing running um, MGM. She said it was so erotic. She said it was so beautifully done. And so I said, let's do stuff like that in the show. Let's elevate it to something else. Let's take it out of just being a soap opera. Because Dan's vision of the show was to do it in a big style, very, very expensive way. And not, you know, because the first, the, the black and white stuff that you see now from the 60s was done on a very limited budget. Here now, we, he wanted to embellish it and keep embellishing it. And uh, if I have the opportunity, I have to tell you this one little thing about budgets and, and, and the, the fights with MGM. I would be, so when I was producing the show, we finally got to the last show to shoot and they wanted to do this huge courtroom scene and Dan insisted that we shoot it all. And I said, Dan, I, I don't think we're gonna, we're gonna make it because of the, you know, we're just not gonna have the time to shoot this and we don't have the money. He says, I don't care, just keep going, it's fine. I'm, I'm okaying it, I'm okaying it. So he takes off and goes to Palm Springs for golf, to play golf, and I'm stuck talking to David Gerber on the phone, and Gerber's calling me up, he's going, Armand, Armand, what the hell is going on? You guys are still shooting, you're still shooting. I said, you know, Dan wants it. He says, well, F Dan, you know, we gotta shoot, we gotta, we gotta pull the plug on this. I said, no, no, well, it's not finished, and you won't have a whole scene if I don't finish this. Uh, I, I'm not shooting it, but I'll work with the director too. You know, and I did, I helped him out. And, but it, <laughs> I took that moment to say, David, I, while I have you on the phone, I'm wondering, you know, since this is the last show and we're gonna be wrapping soon, I was wondering if you would uh, prove uh, crew gifts like jackets that say dark shadows. He goes, what, what? <laughs> you crazy, we're so over budget and you want jackets? I'll give you straight jackets. That's what I'll give you. <laughs> that was the kind of guy I was dealing with. And it was, uh, it, you know, he never took it personally. It was all in good fun. But, you know, we, we, we just had a great time doing the show. Yes, I like the 1991 series very much. It, it's uh, dramatic and emotional. And of course, Robert Cobert's music is magnificent. Yeah. I, I rewatch it, you know, every four or five years. And, and I rewatched it this past summer. Uh, sadly, just a couple of weeks before the death of Ben Cross. Ben Cross. That's the first day when I got there. I don't know if you can see that. That's Dan and myself. Both had, I had a mustache then, and we're, we're, us with the dark glasses. I think we connected immediately um, because we spoke the same language. We spoke film. He, he loved talking about shots, and he said, you know, and then we, the camera will do this, and we to do this, and, and I would do the same thing with him, and he enjoyed that so much. We had that same you know, kind of way of communicating. Right, yes. Uh, you can always tell that you're watching a Dan Curtis movie, not just from Robert Colbert's music, but from that low angle, the camera is looking up at the- and always foreground, always foreground. 
always something in the foreground, never just a flat shot like we're doing right now. There'd be like a piece of a chair or something here. He loved that. And I did too. I, I unconsciously, I guess, got a lot of that from some of his earlier work when I was watching it. But I used to shoot everything like that. I, I love that kind of feeling like this voyeuristic look at, at the scene, you know, like you're, you're observing it. You're the unobserved observer, you know, in, within the context of, of the moment. Right. And speaking of Dan Curtis's earlier work, The Night Stalker and The Night Strangler. Mark, I know you are an expert on those films. How did you begin to watch and study The Night Stalker and The Night Strangler? I, I watched it when it first aired. I was 14 when it aired. Um, they started the, it had a great ad campaign. They started the ads around October. Uh, ABC, uh, a guy by the name of Dan Duran, who was at, in ABC, uh, uh, the PR department at the time, they had cooked up this great ad campaign where you couldn't tell really whether this was an actual vampire or somebody who thought it was a vampire. Mm -hmm. And those ads played from October all the way into January. The anticipation that built up, you know, the, the people was like always, you know, it set the, the, the ratings record for a TV movie when it aired. It beat Brian's song. Uh, Gail Sayers just died. And, uh, you know, it was brought up that Brian's song had set the record for TV movies in that October. They held that record for exactly two months when Night Stalker broke it. And uh, and I, it's one of the reasons really was that that ad campaign, which was fantastic. So if, you know, if you were watching TV and there were only three networks then, you were very aware of this, you knew it was coming, and everybody felt like they had to watch it. Um, and it delivered. It delivered. It was scary. Oh, it, it did. It's 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 a it's a real well. As a matter of fact, I, I you know it has often been said by me um, that this is the movie that actually gave me my profession. Um, hmm. That you know I started uh, my journalism career or my move towards journalism career as a freshman at George Washington University in the spring of nineteen uh, the summer the fall of nineteen seventy four, just two weeks after Richard Nixon uh, resigned the presidency. And George Washington University is just a couple blocks away from the White House. And that Friday the 13th was when the Kolshak TV series started. Mm -hmm. I was surrounded by kids, students, who wanted to be Woodward and or Bernstein. Uh, they all thought that this is what you did as a journalist, that you brought down presidents, that you would have movies made about you. And if they did make a movie about you, Robert Redford or Dustin Hoffman would play your part. And uh, yeah. nobody was confusing me with Robert Redford then or now. but. You know, Kolshak was somebody I identified with. And um, I later found out that a lot of other journalists felt the exact same way, that they felt this was one of the best uh, depictions of a journalist that were ever, uh, was ever put on film, that it really captured that feel of what a journalist was. But it was an amazing movie. It was then, it is now. I show it to my students. Yeah, it's uh, at, at Kent State. And the magic that worked then works now. It makes a movie that's, was done that to these kids in their grandparents' time. It has no CGI, no special effects to speak of. Uh, it was done on a very small budget comparatively. And when that movie is over, they are caught. They are just, so whatever it was about that movie that, that it, and it was a very influential movie because it influenced a lot of people who followed the, the if you go ahead in the generation into the 90s, people who do uh, horror and horror series and they almost all cite the Night Stalker and, uh, and, and, and Dan Curtis as an influence. And it's interesting because Dan came up with the whole idea. I mean, going back to the original Dark Shadows, I said before that Dark Shadows was sneaky. Um, and the reason it was sneaky was it got across an incredible innovation. I mean, Dark Shadows was a very derivative series. You know, it, it, it uh, basically most of the stories ripped off classic literature, you know, and, right. you know, Dan was the first to admit it. Sam Hall famously once said, you know, by the end, we were ripping off Robert Louis Stevenson, Edgar Allan <laughs> Poe, and be Lovecraft. If Stephen King was up and running, we'd still be on the air because we'd be, you know, we'd be, be ripping him off at this point. But Dark Shadows doesn't really have a lot that you can, can pin on as an innovation, something that's, that's, that's different. The one thing that's different, the one thing they do, and it was an accident, like mo a lot of great discoveries, was the character of Barnabas Collins, was the idea that 
they gave a vampire something that no vampire had ever had before. Had ever had any reason to have it, which was a conscience. You know, they, they, Barnabas was humanized. The, the whole idea of where we are now, where you've got humanized, sexualized vampires, Dark Shadows, is, 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 it's, it is the swinging door. And it all comes out of that one, and, and you have to credit a lot to Jonathan for its performance. Mm -hmm. Because Jonathan, because the writers didn't do it. They hired Jonathan to be on the show. What did Jonathan know? He knew he had to play a vampire. Nobody could tell him how to tell a vampire, how to play a vampire. The only thing he knew was that he had to play it, and he knew how long he was going to be on the show. He was going to be on three months, and he knew it, how it was going to end because it was going to end with a big piece of lumber sticking out of his chest at the end of 90 days because that's how they were planning the story arc. He was just going to be a monster like Dracula, predator, pure predator. And then Jonathan goes and does what every actor does. He builds an interior life for his character. And he comes up and he, he plays it. And the audience senses it before anybody else. The audience responds to it. And very, very quickly, this character is gaining in popularity until he's the most popular character on the show. And you can't kill off the most popular character on the show. Vulnerability. That's, yeah. the, that's the, the key. Conscience, vulnerability, and the questions. Always the questions. Um, do I have to live like this? Can, can I reclaim my soul? Can I, can I, can I change? No vampire ever had to change. Why would a vampire change? They were predators. They were animals. And Dark Shadows completely changes the direction of horror. Humanized him. Yeah, it did. And, and, and it, you know, because who's watching Dark Shadows? Well, Anne Rice is watching Dark Shadows. Yeah. A young Anne Rice is sitting in San Francisco thinking, I'm going to take all those questions and I'm going to give them to my immortals. And it's interesting because... Dark Shadows is this, why does it fit? Why, is, why does this, you can't write a sonnet in your time without being influenced by your time. Why does Dark Shadows fit the 1960s so well? Because this is a time when everybody's questioning their place. What's happening in the 1960s? We all grew up then, oh, not much. What did we have? You know, we had an anti-war movement. We had a generation gap. We had a gay rights movement. We had a, a black civil rights movement, black power, a British invasion. The world was turned upside down and inside out. And now all of a sudden, here comes Barnabas Collins. And what is Barnabas Collins? Barnabas Collins is nothing less than vampire liberation. <laughs> That's what it is. It's the, it, it, it is the emancipation proclamation for vampires. You can be anything you want to be. You've been trapped in a box all this time. We're going to let you out of the box. And we're going to let you be whatever you want to be. And it sets the character free. It's, it is. And it so fits that time. And that's why I say Dark Shadows is sneaky. This kind of gets this over and it so suits its time. Because it was this time when everybody, I think that's why it, got, it was, became a phenomenon. I think people who never watched soap operas before, like Arma and I, we would have never thought of a soap opera, but now all of a sudden, who's watching? Teenagers are watching soap operas. Horror fans are watching soap operas. Mm -hmm. Young men are watching soap operas. Young girls are watching soap operas. And, and I think they're identifying with these characters. You have a power figure in Angelique, a woman, a blonde woman, who is the true power figure in that show. And she don't take crap out of nobody. And that's not happening you know, in, in, in anywhere else. And I think people are responding to that, you know. Yeah, I wanted to also pick up on something Armand said about, I knew Wes Craven, because he was from Cleveland. He grew up here. And um, Wes was one of the, and Armand's going to bear this out, because, and by the way, I love Nightmare Cafe. Oh, yeah. Nightmare Cafe was, a, was NBC. NBC had the perfect opportunity to build a perfect lineup, and they had shows just staggered a little bit off. They had Dark Shadows. And then they had Nightmare Cafe and they had Erie, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Put those on one Friday night and you have a fantastic lineup of lead-in going one to the other. And they're always like a season off with all of them. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah. But Wes Craven was one of the sweetest, most soft-spoken. He, he looked and talked like an English professor, which is what he was before he, <laughs> before he turned director. But he felt trapped. He, what Armand was saying, he very much felt trapped by being a horror director. And he, 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 just as what he was allowed to do, he became, he became branded. He became identified with that. 
yeah. and there was no way out. Dan did too. Dan's response was to do Winds of War and War and Remembrance. Dan yeah. basically said, I can't creak another door. He said, you know, I've, I've creaked every door that you can possibly creak. And the reason he then he does the revival is because he did Winds of War and War and Remembrance. He finally knew that he had altered the lead in his obituary because he didn't want the lead line to be Dan Curtis, the creator of Dark Shadows, died yesterday. Now it would say Dan Curtis, Dark Shadows, and Winds of War. And that gave him enough confidence to listen to Brandon Tartikoff's uh, overtures about reviving Dark Shadows in, 90, in 91, and which also was the victim of bad luck because the war yeah. broke out. Mm -hmm. The Gulf right. War broke out right when it was Killing. starting. And yeah, it was dead before it started. I hate to say that about Dark Shadows, but yeah, mm. it was dead before it started. If ever a show needed a second season, it was that one. Absolutely. I wish that the 1991 show could have lasted three, four, five years or even longer, like the other nighttime serials like Knott's Landing. Um, in addition to all of the great horror productions that Dan Curtis did and the two World War II miniseries, you know, he also did crime dramas. He did his two Melvin Purvis movies and his two uh, uh, family dramas when every day was the 4th of July and the long days of summer. And uh, one of his fa personal favorite uh, of his productions, his Western, The Last Ride of the Dalton Gang. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's too bad he couldn't have done a second Western. He and Richard Matheson uh, talked about doing uh, an adaptation of Matheson's novel, Journal of the Gun Years, a Western novel, doing it right. uh, as a, a multi-part miniseries for TNT. He was also dealing with some other things. I, at the time when I was working with him, he was showing me some interesting scripts that he was considering, which were not in the horror genre at all or more socially, um, you know, more socially specific and uh, less, you know, with the horror. So, I mean, he, he was, he did want to branch out and be, do different things, but he, he did relish in the, in the fact that Dark Shadows was his baby and, and put him on the map. You know, it was one of those, you know, those things and, and, and his desire to revisit it and do it in a bigger way in a grander style was, was always, is always from front and foremost. Did you uh, well, continue he, your friendship with Dan Curtis after Dark Shadows? And oh yes, and his family, his, his daughter, yes, his wife passed away then. And oh yeah, we, we keep in touch. And I keep in touch with a lot of the people like Jim, Jim, Jim Pearson. And uh, uh, we talk occasionally. And there was a, a documentary that was made on, on, Dar on uh, Dan Curtis, uh, the man, yeah, that one, Master of Dark Shadows. I'm in it. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we all shared our stories and our experiences working with him. He was genuinely a, uh, uh, a, 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 a very strong leader in, in this industry. I mean, there are people who just, you know, do their job, come in, do their job, and they, and they move along. And, you, you know, you have to think about who was that, who was that. He stood out, he, he, his name, Dan Curtis, he put his name, he branded his, his work. You, you, you could tell a Dan Curtis, a lot of people didn't like it because he used to Zoom a lot, you know, and, and they didn't like the Zoom. A lot of cinematographers would get, oh, please, let's not do this. Like, you know, but he's, no, oh, I want the Zoom, I want the Zoom. And uh, it was a popular thing at the time because it, it cut, cut time down. You didn't have to lay track and, you know, stuff like that. Dan told me that um, the best job he ever had was actually directing uh, Winds of War and War and Remembrance. Was that yeah. um, he said that uh, he felt like he was the general at the head of an army, and he loved it. He said he, he could have it. gone on directing that forever mm -hmm. because uh, I mean it, it was what was it? it ended up being like forty four hours uh, total. Yeah. It was a, a staggering amount War of time. War and Remembrance was longer than Winds right. of War. And and he just he just adored <laughs> he could he could do whatever he wanted and he was like a general you know commanding the troops and setting up whatever shot he wanted if he wanted to do a crane shot he did a crane shot if he wanted and he to took chances he took chances yeah. I mean he you know he he showed some very controversial kind of at the time 
uh, footage, you know, in the concentration camps and all the people being going to the, the gas chambers. It was it was really he 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 kind of broke some um, some ground there. Yeah. He no, no, no. He he definitely did, and and you know, and Herman woke up, you know, trusted him with that too. You mm -hmm. know, they that was a quite a friendship too. Yes. That uh, he said, you know, go ahead and do that. Um, you, you know it. it Dan's career gets more interesting the more you look at it, you know, and even if you just stay within the horror genre, his Jekyll and Hyde. Yeah, you know, I'm a Jack big Hines. Robert Louis Stevenson. Yeah, I'm a big Robert Louis Stevenson fan. And to my mind, and I'm not just saying this because we're talking about Dan, that to me is the best in adaptation of Jekyll and Hyde at anybody's. And I'm throwing Frederick March into the mix, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's that is just, if it hadn't been shot on videotape, Mm -hmm. I think we'd be talking about it as a, you know, as a masterpiece now. Uh, it tends to get lost because, A, it aired on ABC late night. Yeah. Secondly, uh, it was shot on videotape, and it was shot under incredible circumstances because Rod Serling was going to write the script originally. And it actually, although Rod's name isn't on it, he, the, the script we've, has been found, and it turns out that Rod contributed much more to the script than we thought. Um, you know, and, and Jason Robards was going to play the lead and it was going to be shot in London. And then there was a strike which shut down production in London and they moved it to New York and they had lost Rod Serling at that point. And then there was a technician strike in New York which shut New York down so they moved to Canada and they shot and ended up shooting it on videotape in Canada with Jack Palance. And uh, it's, it's an amazing, amazing movie. And uh, and again, my favorite of of all the there are there are no shortage of Jekyll and Hyde interpretations out there, no. but uh, it's, it it, it's very well pretty done. amazing. It's very well done, and uh, once again, Robert mm -hmm. Colbert's music is outstanding, and and uh, uh, Matheson and Curtis's Dracula with Jack mm -hmm. Palance, I think, is one of the best adaptations of Dracula, especially if it could have been three hours instead of two. Right. You're on it, Jeff. That's exactly right. Is that uh, that's another one that got compromised because CBS at the, the Richard had written a script at three hours, um, and it would they were going to do it to a fairly well at three hours, and just as they were leaving to go to Europe to shoot, CBS cut the time commitment to two hours. Now, can you imagine having to butcher a script by an hour on the run as you're leaving? So. They had to make so many decisions. It's amazing that movie came out as well as it did. It's not what they wanted to do, but the original script, Richard's original script was published in a book I edited called Bloodlines, right. uh, which has Richard's censored script for I Am Legend and uh, his three-hour script for Dracula. And oh. you can really see what they wanted to do in that three-hour script, which would have been amazing, just mm -hmm. amazing. Oh, yes. Uh, the tales like uh, the, uh, the baby in the sack, and uh, the gold coins coming out of Dracula's clothing. So yes, it, it, it would have been definitive if it had been the three hour length. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I, I, and Palance was great. He was. You know, it's, Dan told me, you know, sitting across from Dan at his desk, Dan said to me, you know why Palance was so good? Palance scared me. He said, he's, he's the only person I've ever worked with who actually intimidated me. He said, he's the only person, he's the only person who ever played Dracula who could have shot his hand out and made you believe that he could grab you by the throat and lift you off the ground. And you know why? It's because he could. That's why. Wow. And that really does get to that. He brings an immense power uh, to, to that Dracula. Yes. So and, I would, and, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Jack Palance in an interview said that it, that it, it scared him. Uh, he said that he felt yeah, disturbed yeah. as he was playing <clears throat> Dracula and had been offered several more movies uh, in which he would have played Dracula, but he turned them down because he, he, he didn't want to repeat that performance. Mm -hmm. So many actors worked with Dan Curtis over and over. He had his own repertory company of of people like Jeffrey Lewis and John Carlin and David Dukes and Jack Palance who would make three, four, five movies with him. Yeah, and, and, and behind the scenes people too, you know, and, and the writers, I mean, you know, the people who like Richard and, and, and Bill Nolan who uh, work with him on several occasions. And, you know, 
you know, Bill Nolan told me once that, you know, we, we got to talking about Dan's famous temper. And, and Bill said something which I thought was, was, was very insightful. He said, you know, you know, Dan can lose his temper. We all know that. He said, but the thing is, Dan doesn't hold grudges and he doesn't suspect you're going to hold grudges. The next day it's over. He's surprised if you're still brooding about it. If you're still brooding about it or feel bad and then he's gonna feel bad that you feel bad. To him, that was yesterday and it's done. And, you know, I think that's the way Dan knows. Sometimes there were relationships that didn't survive that, you know, and the most famous of that was Darren McGavin, you know, but Darren was a pit bull and so is Dan, yeah. you know, yeah. two pit bulls in the same arena are not sooner or later, they're going to start snapping at each other. And that's kind of what happened on Night Strangler, um, where, you know, and that story is told in the book, but, um, but you're right. I think the proof is in the pudding of, of how many people went back and willingly work with Dan or, or would have. I mean, listen to what Armand's saying, you know, if Dan was on the phone, you're going to listen, right? Yeah. You're yeah. going to go back. Definitely. Yeah. No, he, he was definitely, he loved people, but he also d could lose his temper. I've seen him lose his temper. He never, he was never that way with me. I mean, I never had an experience to have any kind of altercation with him or anything like that, but I've seen him and I used to worry that that other person was going to just crumble, you know, because he, he could be very intimidating, but you know, he came out, look, there were a whole bunch of people who came from the studio system that were like that. Harry Cohen. I mean, if they, these, these, these heads of studios were like uh, tyrants, Louis B. Mayer in a different way, maybe, but you know, all these guys who started studios knew that they had to hold on to their position and their strength and maintain their strength. I had a director tell me a very famous director. I'll go unnamed at this point. Um, You'd know him in a set. Everybody knows him. Big Academy Award winning movies. And everything. He said to me, you know what I like to do on the first day of, of shooting? I, I, I assemble the crew. I bring everybody together and I, I look for something. Like, for example, I say, Who, who's in charge of props here? And, and the person will raise their hand and, and uh, he'd say, I hate that prop. And you know what? You're fired. I don't need you. I'm going to replace you. So right then and there, I said, why would you do that? And he said, because it shows who's the boss. And, you, and they f will come to work knowing that they have to respect everything I say. I said, well, okay, that's one way of doing it. I try to do it in a completely different way. I like people to become involved, not come in with colitis in their stomach because they're afraid they're going to be fired. I want them to come to work saying, I love working, it's so exciting, it's, the atmosphere is creative and everything. So there's two different styles, but the old studio system was like that, the tyrant. Otto Preminger was well known to be that way. You know, he used to yep. scream yep. at actors and crew and, you know, but I don't work Famously that Famously drove I Tom Tryon to, 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 to become a writer because of working yeah. on the Cardinal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. a famous story is that uh, he's, he's so brutalized him on the, on the side of, of Cardinal. Part of it, I think, is, is you know, when you're, you're confronted with such the enormity of the project you're working on, there's so many decisions and things you have to do. So you don't want to lose control of all that. So you maintain your strength and you say, this is the way I want it done. God damn it. You know, this is what we're going to have it. So, you know, that was a style. And I'm sure people are still like that today. There's a lot of people that are still like that today, you know, who are very, you know, uh, kind of insulated and they kind of like, Kelly, it's going to be my way or no way, you know, and I don't know, for me, it's not the best way to work. I think you gain more from people by opening the doors and letting them feel like they're contributing. There's collaboration and there's kind of a, an enjoyment, a pleasure of working and creating something. Armand, if you could direct any story, novel, any, any movie, what would it be? Oh God, so many. I don't have any specific one that right now that I could pull out. I mean, I mean, there was talk at one point of resurrecting Dark Shadows, uh, you know, even uh, just before uh, Dan. I, I know when the Johnny Depp thing came out, he hated that. Everybody did. And uh, but right now, what could I do? Uh, well, I just look for good material. I look for stuff that's uh, interesting to me and, and, and stuff that I think I can lend and tell a good story. 
you know, from which I can, I can, because we're storytellers, like you said about Dan Curtis, like he was a good storyteller, Mark, you know, he, he would sit there and he'd enthrall you. Well, that's how I started. I used to tell stories when I was in the Boy Scouts. I used to sit around the campfire. I used to create these scary stories for, and everybody would be afraid because I guess I, I was very visual in my head and I would describe things, you know, I'd create the setting and all that stuff. And, and Dan did exactly that. And, and that's, that's the, I think, you know, the thing about a good storyteller, you, you, you can capture the audience, encapsulate the whole audience there. And Mark, do you have uh, some new books coming out? I'm, uh, yeah, actually, the, the, the last one was, uh, which was just published last year, is on the Shawshank Redemption. It's ah. a sort of a deep dive look at the making of the Shawshank Redemption. And uh, that was a lot of, I, I was, I actually covered the making of the film uh, in 1993 in, in Mansfield, Ohio. Uh, I was a film critic at the time. And so uh, I kind of, somebody asked me, how long were you working on that book? And I said, 25 years. And it was a joke, but it's kind of not because the first interview I did uh, was with Morgan Freeman uh, on the, in the shadow of that prison in, in Ohio. And he was dressed as red. And uh, so, you know, I, I ended up doing about 70 interviews for that book. And uh, I could have done easily 70 more. I, everybody who worked in that film had a great story to tell. It's just a marvelous story. From Stephen King on down to the woman who trained the rats for the prison scenes. Everybody had, had just wonderful stories. Um, and then the book I'm working on right now is I'm working on a biography of Edgar Allan Poe for St. Martin's. Oh, um, So I'm deep into the research of that right now. Um, yeah, I haven't shared that wide yet, but I'm, I'm very deep into the research on that. And I think it's going to be a, a rather unconventional biography of, of Mr. Poe, you oh, know, great. who's also have been trapped by the horror field, <laughs> you know, but there was a lot more to Mr. Poe than just uh, the telltale heart. Yeah. And you are a, a recognized expert on Mark Twain. Are you going to be speaking about Twain in the weeks to come? You brought that up, did you? <laughs> Not, you know, uh, Jeff knows this, but I've also been playing Mark Twain on stage for 40 years um, uh, with Al Holbrook's permission and blessing. I wouldn't even step foot on stage without Hal's blessing for this, but I've been doing this since I was 22. So really now it's closer to uh, 42 years that I've been doing this. And the only difference is that when I started, it took me two hours to look like this. <laughs> I used to actually spend two hours in makeup never realizing that I was showing myself what I was going to look like when I was 64, you know, but yeah, five of my books are on Mark Twain. Um, and, uh, I'll, I'll undoubtedly revisit it at some point, you know, because I'm always performing as Twain. I'm always writing about Twain, giving papers, uh, about Mark Twain. So, you know, he's never far from my heart, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's one of the nice things about, I've tried to Bill Nolan about this is that Bill always feels like he didn't have the career that he should have because he wasn't a specialist. That if you're a Stephen King or somebody like that, you can have a big, big career. And Bill felt like, you know, because Bill's written a lot of different types of stuff. He's written sports books. He's written books on racing, biography, film biographies. Mm -hmm. He's written horror. He's written science fiction, screenplays. Uh, he's, one of, he's a great Dashiell Hammett scholar. And, and Bill will say, you know, I should have specialized in one thing and I, you know, I would have had a bigger career. And I thought, not you weren't built that way. Are not interested in that one thing. That's yeah. right. And, you're, and, and you have to be built that way. You have to be willing. It's like, you know, Armand was saying that he can go from one type of a project to another. You know, um, I'm sort of the same way with, with, with my books. I've, I've been at book festivals where people have passed my table and they'll look down at the table and they'll go, I don't get it. And I said, well, what's not to get? They said, well, what's the common theme? And I said, well, me, I'm the common theme. You know, I wrote these, all these different books and there's one on Theodore Roosevelt and there's a slice of theater history. There's a book on Columbo. There's a book on, you know, on Mark Twain. These right. are all my areas of interest. And I think, you know, uh, I, th there's a blessing and a curse either way you go. You are probably gonna have a little less monetary if you're not a specialist because America loves to be able to brand you. They love yeah. to be able to say Alfred Hitchcock, thriller director, suspense director, you know, horror writer, Stephen King. Yeah. Or that actor always plays comedy. 
I can't a, see in the drama. Yeah, yeah. It's a very 20th century American conceit, you know, where we have to label something, you know, and and it's like, like Edgar Allan Poe. You know, if you had said to Edgar Allan Poe, "You're a horror writer," he wouldn't have even known what the term meant. He would have looked at it like, "What are you talking about?" You know, gothic. You, you mean, all right, gothic? But you, you know, it's if it was the best way to tell the story. That's what they did. You know, not one of the great horror writers of the 1800s who Dan ripped off for Dark Shadows, <laughs> Mary Shelley, Bram Stoker, Robert Louis Stevenson, and Edgar Allan Poe. If you went to all of them and you, you looked at their careers, they would have never considered themselves horror specialists. Mm -hmm. They would have just said, Robert Louis Stevenson said, today I'm writing Treasure Island, tomorrow I'm writing A Child's Garden of Verses, and the next day I'm going to write The Body Snatcher because mm -hmm. that's what, what takes me today. You know, they were writers, just like directors are directors and writers are writers. And we have this American mania to have to identify it and have to label it. And that can be, it can be financially rewarding because America loves branding, but it you also know, can be terribly limiting. There were a couple of directors that kind of transcended that. I mean, look at Willie Wyler. William Wyler directed like the heiress, uh, Weathering Heights, then he does The Collector, Funny Girl, Ben-Hur. I mean, like, that's a very eclectic, but, but all great films, you know? They are. Weiler, Robert Wise, and, and Howard Hawks are probably the three great directors who bounced Billy from Wilder. genre to genre. Billy Wilder, too. Yeah, and, and you know, although Billy Wilder, he always kind of has the more comedy. He does have that noir stuff, but... Uh, Robert Wise, my goodness. I mean, yeah. Wise is going from, you know, biography to, yeah. uh, to horror, to science fiction, to musicals, to, you know, and it's all good. It's all exactly. Big. But Robert exactly. Wise doesn't have the same reputation, unfortunately, that Hitchcock does. Right. So like, well, why not? Why does? Because we're suspicious of versatility. You know, we're almost suspicious of it. It's like, well, if somebody's that versatile, there must be something... You know, why doesn't he just stick to Westerns like John Ford did? Why didn't he, and even John Ford didn't just stick to Westerns, you know? We're off topic, aren't we? We're, we, 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 <laughs> no, have strayed. <laughs> we have strayed from Collins Ford, haven't we? <laughs> yeah. Well, our time is running out. So this has been a wonderful hour. I, I thank you so yeah. much. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. I want to thank my guests, Armand Masriani and Mark Dewidziak. And I want to thank the Motion Picture and Television Fund Anthony Taylor and everyone at Monsterama, and Suzanne, our producer director of this hour. So thank you so much for participating. We could, we could go on and talk like this all night, but I hope to talk with both of you again sometime soon. Yes, same here. Well, you've already discovered how shy and retiring I am, but so if you can get <laughs> me out of my shell, I'll, I'll be glad to come back. Okay, all right. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>